Hey everyone, today I've got Scout Leader Wiley with me for some conversation. Uh, Scout Leader is a theory and ritual artist, um, practitioner and theorist behind Metamodern Magic. Metamodern Magic, which I'd love to explore more in this conversation, um, is, well, let me read from the Meta Modern Spirituality Wiki, in which there's an entry. Uh, it reads, Metamodern Magic is a cross-disciplinary framework that seeks to enrich every individual's knowledge of self and sense of being in the world through individual and communal ritual practice. Drawing from the work of John Verveke, Greg Enriquez, Mary Louise von Franz, and Catherine Bell, among others, it encompasses axioms and psychotechnologies from all major epistemes of human history synthesizing and recontextualizing ancient and conventional wisdom for a post postmodern world. Um, so that's sort of the intro. And then let's dive in and, and hear more about all the details of it. So uh, Scout, Scout Leader Wiley, thanks for, so much for being here. And um, yeah, welcome. Yeah, thank you. Wow. It's like that intro is so, um, so good. I'm like intimidated by, um, by that that description, which is hilarious because I, I wrote it. <laughs> <laughs> so you've been doing some of this stuff for a while and I'm super, super interested. Um, I find, yeah, there's a lot of overlap, overlap, a lot of synergy, uh, confluence, consilience, et cetera, et cetera, between what you're doing and, and, you know, what I'm thinking about is this metamodern spirituality. So I don't know, in your own words, explain a little bit more, like what is metamodern magic and yeah. Mm, yeah, I'd love to. Um, it's essentially trying to look at all of these different, uh, what you might call superstitious um, ways of looking at the world and sort of like going back to them with the knowledge that um, we aren't necessarily uh, trying to get at objective truths here. It's, it's more the call for the, uh, for the narrative, the sort of revival of that. Um, some, something that really helps provide that or has helped provide that for me and people that I know um, are sort of personal mythologies and communal mythologies. So just to give like a little bit of, I guess, background into what's really um, inspired me to, to start putting this together. Um, when I was in college, I experienced a lot of uh, isolation, but I also experienced a lot of community and that community sort of like had its own like uh, lore, like they were very intentional about it too. It was like, they had their own lore, they had um, um, like community rituals and whatnot. And that uh, was one of the most profound experiences of my life in terms of self-discovery and um, figuring out like who I was and what I wanted, because previous to that, uh, you know, I was 18. Everything was about what my, my parents wanted me to do. You know, everything was about what the adults around me wanted me to do. And, uh, this was the first kind of time that I was able to experience, um, sort of being auto poetic, right. In a conscious way. Um, fast forward to like, un uh, learning about, rituals from the perspective of Verveke and he talks about how rituals and art and this increase in human cognition uh, all came around at, at the same time and so they you know they're all sort of effects of this advance in human cognition and this is the same advance in, in cognition that allow us to connect to people that aren't part of our immediate family right so ritual and creative expression and um relationship with other human beings and relationship with nature uh, are all very intertwined. And, and I think we're, we're at a time now where our relationship with nature is tumultuous. Um, she's threatening to leave us actually, you know, she's packed her bags a jillion times, but now she means it, right? <laughs> so, you know, we gotta, we gotta get our shit together, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she's serious um, now. You know, you mentioned like that, collegiate experience. And there, there are certain instances in life that where there are still opportunities to engage ritualistically that are sort of, you know, socially accepted and that sort of a thing. Um, and one of those is like fraternities and sororities, and there's a bunch of ritual things there, but like community that communities that arise in collegiate and university contexts. Um, but then it's sort of like, once you get past that, 
where do you get your ritual, you know? And so I think there's mm -hmm. a lot of nostalgia that gets built up around that time of life and, you know, reunions and things like that happen because it's sort of like now after that, even if you're a part of that, you know, I wasn't myself. Well, I certainly was involved in certain kinds of communities that had certain kinds of rituals, but nothing so sort of, you know, so, some are more kind of formalized than others. But yeah, once you're sort of outside of a context like that, and you're sort of let loose into the world, it's sort of like, what ritual containers are there other than in some ways these kinds of older religious traditions which for many reasons aren't aren't really palatable anymore right so it's sort of like it seems like maybe there's this need that we need to like well who who else is going to be making some ritual containers for folks is that is it something like that that's sort of driving the stuff that you're up to yeah absolutely um and that was really well said i think what you're getting at with the our options as far as rituals are concerned or as far as re religiosity are concerned is like um, these frameworks that are very old and uh, we're not living in the world that those tools were created for. We're living in a, a world that's, um, I wouldn't say it's more complex, but we, we're now in a place where we need to change the way that we relate to the world. We need to change the way that we, um, we understand the world and rituals have traditionally been a way of uh like Catherine bell says that it's a way of um of creating meaning uh, uh out of the chaos of life that's one of you know her her main ideas as far as rituals are concerned and and it's it's um you know we, people talk about there being like a meaning crisis and whatnot and, and i think it's funny because it's like yeah there's like a meaning crisis but it's it's like so i don't know if you're familiar with naomi most but she has this interesting way of, of looking at it where it's like the meaning making um, status quo is what's experiencing a crisis but there isn't like an ob objectively a meaning crisis for everyone because mm -hmm not everyone has always related to the dominant uh, meaning making mechanisms, which, um, mm -hmm. and this is, this is not new at all because like it, you have a, a Christian imperialism, right? And the, the, this rises to power and everyone's way of understanding God is not this way, but because, you know, um, the Christians at this time are, are dominating and that it's not exclusive to Christianity either because there are other contexts where Christians were persecuted and, and whatnot. Um, not every it's true that not everyone has made meaning in the same way and we've been expecting um everyone to be making meaning in the same way and with the concept of metamodern magic and ritual art the reason why it's magic with the k is because most like magic systems uh like levee and satanism and and uh the lima and whatnot are are focused on the individual's like sovereign power um, and so I'm kind of like playing with this idea of, of that in the context of community. Um, it's a way of trying to reconcile this, this individualistic, uh, streak that Western capitalist, uh, countries seem to have and, and desire to keep. Uh, and there's a lot of, uh, beauty in that, of sort of differentiating and individuating. Um, but we've lost the ability to connect. Uh, beyond that. And so the question really behind it is how do we uh, reconcile our personal mythology of who we are and what we want to become, what we're becoming, not even what we want to become, um, with what the world is becoming and, and uh, really bridge that gap that is not really there, but we've kind of created in our experience of being individuals. Mm. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let me ask you this too, because um, in the kind of I don't want to lose some of those threads, but hopefully we can weave some of them back in. As you were saying, you know, yeah, the the kind of ritual containers such that they are that do exist were sort of for a different time. Um, yeah. There's also a way, I think, in which the sensibility in which they were engaged is of a different time and what they were thought to believe or or bring about is different in the sense that when I think of magic with a K, like chaos magic and whatnot, there's an awareness of uh, a different sort of engagement, right? Like one form of ritual is is more like magic, maybe with a C or, 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 or I think, yeah, let's just say that. And correct me if I'm wrong, but this is the way I think of it is sort of like 
um, oh, I'm going to say a, an incantation and I'm going to transform this substance into another or something. You know, you, you see that like in the Catholic mass and transubstantiation, right? There's a, a kind of, yeah. And like, there's a belief that this thing is actually changing in a way that's like objective. And the way that I interpret magic with the K is more like, um, it's not quite that so much as the participation in the ritual is actually changing you almost subjectively. So this, the change that's occurring is sort of your perspective on what's happening and your interaction and your engagement with, with the world. And so it's much more kind of subjective transformation than, uh, which of course can then lead to intersubjective mm -hmm. transformations and things. But is there something about that? That's what I pick up on when, when you're talking about uh, metamodern magic and other contexts too, is the sense that like, it's not the magic of let's say incantations and try to cast spells on things or people, right? It's like a magic of changing our, our way of engagement with the world that, that, is, that is different. Is that, is something like that, right? Yeah, no, really, yeah, well said. Um... So I would say the, if you were to make, like, understand it in linear terms, the transformation that takes place with um, a ritual practice, or specifically what I'm referring to as ritual art, in order to differentiate it from traditional ritual, um, is you, the objective uh, shift is not uh, directly causally related to the ritual, it's indirectly causally related. So like, when you uh, change your perception, right? When you, so what you're doing, like uh, in a lot of rituals, you'll go into a trance state or you'll go into, um, there's also flow, right? And Ruvenki talks about this and I'll leave that to him because he's read more books about it. But um, in terms of trance specifically, when you're in a trance state, um, and I learned this from like studying NLP and stuff, you, your conscious, you're in an altered state where your conscious mind can't, your conscious mind is looking for specific types of patterns um, because it wants to solve problems. So it's, it's looking at, through these filters, through, through a particular, you're looking at a particular map, right? It's like when you're on your phone and you look at the um, Google maps and it's like, do you want to see terrain or do you want to see the bike lanes, you know? So when you're, and your everyday consciousness, um, you're looking at uh, the bike lane, right? And let's say when you go to a trance, now you're looking at the terrain map. It's the same area, you're just, you're seeing different things about it. So when you get really skilled at shifting your uh, ability to perceive the world in a certain way, um, this is the magic with the K. It's, it's, it's not reality shifting to meet you, it's, you are seeing things about reality that you didn't know were there. Um, and as a result of that, you act differently and it's your action that uh, creates the objective result. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, so that, right. So one way that for me that that's really interesting is that like, if you live uh, from the kind of perspective of like, uh, like I'm just, everything is just material and, and it's, you know, mundane and there's no there's no magic in the world everything is sort of disenchanted uh you inhabit the world in a certain way and then you engage with people in certain ways you engage your life in a certain way that that is sort of dull and lacks vibrancy and by a shift in just engagement of seeing things as having magic to them as enchanted as 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 being full of vibrancy and possibility and potential and beauty then you engage the world differently and then you act differently. And then the things that happen to you are different. It, you know, it's sort of like, there's a cascade effect on, um, on, and it, it, and, and so I, it seems like ritual is one way to help facilitate that kind of shift of, of mental engagement. Is that right? Yeah. I'm sort of referring to this as neo magical thinking, even though it's like a terrible name for it because the term trans rationality already exists. Right. Mm -hmm. But um, <laughs> I like using neo-magical thinking because I think um, people, anytime I try to talk about trans rationality with anyone who's not like, hasn't read like Wilbur or Jung or anything, um, they're like, yeah, no, that sounds like a, probably a bad idea. And I'm like, okay, uh -huh. well, neo-magical thinking, it's like, okay, you're already admitting that like you're taking magical thinking and you're like, you're kind of being like, it's the whole, it's like a, 
it's like the sincere irony thing, you know, where it's like you are uh, fully serious, but you're self-conscious about how serious you are. Neo-magical thinking is like, no, I literally just made that up. But like in making that up, I just learned something about myself that's true. So like I still access the truth in a way. Yes. Um, yeah. Like you like the resurgence and the popularity of astrology, um, but using it as like a tool for understanding your, your psychology as opposed to understanding your fate, mm. um, I think is a really good example of that. Yeah. So this so talk a little bit about a causal representational systems or ARS. That's something that, that that's linked to this. And, and that's another entry in the meta modern wiki here. And I was reading that. I feel like it dovetails with all this, or maybe this, this is kind of the phrase that expresses yeah. everything you kind of just said. Yeah. Yeah. No, this is a really good segue into that. I mean, it's like a really fancy word, but it's a pretty simple. Uh, I, I think it's essentially so traditionally and this is this is what um i think the difference between uh traditional magical thinking and uh metamodern magic or neo-magical thinking is like uh our original relationship to uh something like a, a spirit right or an ancestor or like anything ineffable or uh the planetary body like the celestial bodies is one of uh surrendering power over to something greater than us without acknowledging the power and the inc like the fact that we're a part of the, the fabric of reality. So there's a lot of, in the past, uh, humans being separate from nature. Um, there's, a, in like a more tribal setting, there's like a, a, a knowing of how small we are but not necessarily an acknowledging of how big we are. Mm. Uh, in modernity, you have an acknowledging of how big we are, but you don't have a humility to temper that. And then that we get mm. my env environmental destruction, which we're now experiencing the consequences of. Um, past that modernity threshold, uh, and even into the post-post-modernity threshold, which we're currently in, um, there's an ability to hold both because we've experienced both. So you're moving, in your relationship to uh, anything that's greater than you or anything that is uh, ambiguous or difficult to really rationalize or understand, like a relationship with a spirit, you know, or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, you're moving from a uh, causal relationship of this has power over me or I have power over it to uh, like, it's a simultaneous experience of it's an other, but it's also you, it's a reflection of you. So uh, to give a more specific example, uh, I've had experiences where I go into the woods and I hear a voice, right? And um, rather than the voice being some negative entity that like wants to hurt me, um, it's simply a part of myself, right? And it's a, it's a representation of a part of myself and I'm now experiencing that part of myself through uh the phenomenon of this voice mm -hmm. um and i'm not necessarily negating that it could be a spirit that lives in the woods but that's not necessarily the point the point is what can i learn about myself through the experience of meeting the spirit in the word woods what uh what does the story teach me you know is sort of the yeah the essence of that is that clear or yeah 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 no and 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 so this is where i feel like some of this ties back into the the issues that you're bringing up around environmental degradation and our kind of broken um <clears throat> relationship with yeah. the earth you know Absolutely. and this yeah because then it's like how can we utilize this this way of thinking to maybe ground us again in some in in healthier relationships with well, with the earth, but also with each other, with, you know, the systems that we live in. It's like, how can, how can ritual or neo-magical understandings of ritual help frame healthier connections, I guess, would be kind of the question. And yeah. So I don't yeah. know if you have any thoughts on that. That's a big topic, but. Yeah. Well, I think that the, so, and this is another uh, sort of element of that whole metamodernist structure of feeling, which is very exciting for me. Um, to, to see is this sort of need to anthropomorphize 
um, and see life and things that might not be from a biological pr perspective accurately defined as living. Um, like wh what does what does it mean for something to be alive? Uh, and how do we use that word metaphorically in a way that um, helps us connect more deeply to our environment? So I, I can give an example of a like a guided meditation that I led in one of my workshops where um, you're connecting to your body and then you're connecting to your environment. And the deeper you connect to uh, different levels of your psyche, so you connect to the body and then you connect to the, um, to the emotions, you connect to the spirit, you connect to uh, your behaviors and all these different elements of yourself and manifestations of yourself. And each time you do that, you think, well, if my environment had skills, if my environment had behaviors, if I looked at my environment as if it had a, a soul and a personality, mm -hmm. um, you create empathy and rapport with it, mm -hmm. uh, which then leads to respect and reverence. We have this strange, and I don't know if this, this is, I don't know if this can be like hacked or, or deleted from like human experience, or if we just need to trick ourselves in this way that I'm proposing, um, where we tend to like, what, if you think about like the fact that we enslaved people, right. Uh, we, and we still do, we justify it by dehumanizing them. Mm -hmm. and that's how we convince ourselves we objectify. And so when we objectify, we disconnect. Um, so even though objects are objects <laughs> and we can acknowledge that they're objects, if we behave as if they have lives, if we behave as if everything around us is imbued with some sort of um, energy that we can connect to, um, that we can sense and that we can engage with through concepts such as like, oh, it has a personality, it has a soul. Um, I think that that's pro a promising way to incentivize deeper care yeah for everything displaying that care for everything around us yeah yeah 100 percent. i think that's totally spot on and i mean so yeah one of the things i got really excited about when i was reading the vermeulen and uh von deniker i always just say his name wrong probably still will um <laughs> but uh von deniker uh von deniker when, when i was reading their work and they talk about the as if perspective the sensibility of right. living as if and i was like yes yeah. like you and i think that that kind of undergird so much of what you're saying is like um there's a there's an engagement with things as if for the for the end result that if you live as if that really has a a change in the world right i mean it's it's this it's this strange paradox where if you just look at something for what it is quote unquote then you yeah. it engenders a certain kind of relationship which then can lead to kind of yeah like treating it poorly or not treating it well, which is to say that you're, if you were to treat it as though it, as if it were more than what it is, then you actually find you have a healthy relationship with it, which means in a kind of paradoxical way that you need to engage with things as though they're more than what they are. Because if that's what engenders healthy, salutary relationships and connections with things, then that's real. You know what I mean? So it's sort of like, yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, that was that was thought number one. And then thought number two was like, um, it's sort of, you know, this phrase, the more than human world, um, or more than, yeah, the more than human world. It's it's like, it, we, we have a tendency and the ability to anthropomorphize in the way that you're talking about of sort of seeing things as if they're like us, or they're living or what have you. And yet, in some ways, that's almost dramatically narrowing what they are, right? Especially when you're talking about hyper objects and things, it's sort of like, um, but because hyper objects are so hard to wrap our minds around, it's, it's like, even though we're in some ways not giving things their full due, if we can, there, there are certain means or uses of anthropomor anthropomorphization, uh, anthropomorphizing things that, the worst uh, word <laughs> <laughs> it's a hard one. Um, it, but like, you know, it, it serves a purpose that even though it's another example of it, but it's almost the backwards, it's like, 
it's it's making things less than what they are, but it's it more than what we would treat them otherwise, or something like that. You know what I mean? And, and it, it and again, it, yeah, yeah. So I don't yeah. know. These are just thoughts that are coming up from a, while you're talking, but yeah. I think it's really cool. Well, I I think I know what you mean by hyper objects, but so. I think that that concept is like similar to the concept of uh, uh, in like anti Oedipus when they talk about machines um, uh, of like machines being not just like physical things, but also uh, like I'm, correct me if I'm wrong, but like a hyper object is like a, like a would would like a, a, a certain social system be yeah. considered? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, culture. is that a hyper object? Well, sort of, yeah. I mean, when I, I think one of the great examples about, um, oh gosh, the guy, the name of the guy who kind of coined the term is escaping me at the moment, but um, talking about climate change, because you're talking about a system that is sort of so complex, it's, uh, it's kind of beyond your immediate ken, right? And it's like no one person can conceive of what the climate is and what it's doing, right? It's a, uh, and, uh, and so, we need to engage these things because they're real, right? The climate is a real thing. It's just that, well, right. we're little kind of primates that have tiny brains compared to what is required for, you know, grasping what the climate is, right? And so there's like a sense in which, well, we are good at anthropomorphizing things. So what if we thought about the climate or earth itself as being a living organism that we have a relationship to, that we have responsibilities to, right? That's a way to deal with what we can't comprehend in ways that we can it's sort of a translation process that's uh, efficacious and so the very fact that it's efficacious means that there's some reality there even though it's not real anyway that's how i interpret some of this stuff yeah no i hear you it sounds like what you're saying is that uh there's a realness in the sense of tangibility and then there's a realness in the sense of things that aren't tangible but affect what's tangible yeah okay yeah no i hear you yeah well, and, and there's also, there's a sense in which, right, it's like, um, so, so we tend to think about the reality of things as like, uh, okay, here's a cup, and so it's here, and we can agree on that, and so it's a thing, and so, yeah, that's real, right, but like, did you not see the cup? It's here, it's real. <laughs> so, oh, no, this is the, the need for intersubjective verification here. Um, but so <laughs> the, the things that we can point to and say, yes, it's, it's real. Um, and then that kind of justifies the way that we engage with them. But then it's sort of like, uh, okay, the, if the, if, uh, let's say the land that I live on is not alive, right. Uh, in the, in a kind of classic biological sense, right. Like a, 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 if some biologists and people came over here and they're like, Hey, and I'm like, look at my land, you know, it's, this is, and I, I have a relationship to the land. Um, yeah. you know, then it's like, well, someone could say, well, that's not real. Right. But by having that relationship, I treat the land as a land should be treated right in a way that if someone who just looks at, Oh, well, that's not real. Well, what do you do to it then? Well, then you extract minerals from it and you sell it, you know, for you know raw commodities because that fits your sense of well, this is just a thing, right? Um, and so that's what I mean by the way that I interpret a lot of this meta modern magic stuff is that things that aren't in that sense objectively real things, if they are still engaged in a in a sense that produces an end result that is overall more efficacious and better than this kind of more correct engagement then that seems to suggest that that's real. If, I mean, they're, you know, pragmatically speaking, if that's what works, then like that seems to have some reality to it. So that's what I'm yeah. getting at. Yeah. And I, so I, you know, I love to appeal to the Myers-Briggs despite its unfortunate <laughs> lack of accuracy. Um, but yeah, you're speaking to my extroverted thinking function so hard right now. Absolutely. Like that's, you know, if we can't convince ourselves to go back to, and I don't think we should, because what's the point in going back? Like we experience time in a very relatively linear way with how we, you know, when we look at like historical trends, we can't return to uh, our respective indigenous cultures as Western capitalist uh, people or people who've been framed and molded and shaped by the experience of 
Western capitalism in the developed world. We just mm. can't go to the forest and like go, you know, go back to square one. Like yeah. we, um, and we, 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 we don't need to because uh, like, it's not progress that's the bad thing. It's progress in the, for the sake of progress and at mm. the expense of a healthy ecosystem. So we're not seeing ourselves as a part of a ecosystem. When we look at the earth as an organism, right? So we don't have to look at it as a goddess anymore, but we can look at it as an organism that we then reduce to an archetype because we have tiny primate brains that need archetypes in order to you know, understand mm. complex information. <laughs> Mm. so you know yeah we, the earth is it doesn't have to be a literal goddess to be treated like one mm. Mm. or yeah and there's also then the sense of like how then do we expand our sense of archetypes maybe to match these sorts of things mm. that's that's kind of an exciting you know prospect yeah, too that. um do yeah. you see it as being uh, personally i see it happening with friends and in the culture more broadly like i i see this I don't know. Uh, I, it's, it sounds corny, but I see this hunger, you know, for, right. for ritual, right? It's like, yeah. uh, like, like people get that. And, and um, uh, do you see that as well in terms of like, do you, is there a, uh, an element that you see more culturally of people are like, yeah, like, uh, like mm -hmm. there's that, there's that, that quote that again, Vermeulen talks about in that show girls where like, just because, um, just because it isn't real doesn't mean I don't feel it or something like that. I think that there's some way that people really feel that, no, like you don't have to believe that like this is some ontologically true thing to be able to appreciate what you can get out of it and the benefits that it brings you individually and, and in society or something. And I feel like I see that happening when people are waking up to that. But is that your, what's your experience with that? Yeah, so like the whole like enlivenment piece that um I of course I have to like get on there and write more about that but I so I didn't really coin the term I I heard it somewhere like the term the word enlivenment I think there's there's a book I haven't read it but I think it comes from this book that someone I know was talking about enlivenment and I liked how it sounded like the word enlightenment and the enlightenment was this time of like oh we finally found the answer we're rational animals and everything makes sense. And we just have to think really hard and then everything will make sense. And, and the world's going to be, you know, I don't know if you know the, um, the Sufjan Stevens song, uh, uh, come on, feel the Illinois. I know that album pretty well, but I don't know if I know that song. Yeah. It's a great album, but that song is really, is really good because it speaks to kind of like, uh, that the enlightenment kind of, uh, mindset of oh gosh like humans are invincible and our minds are the best thing that's ever happened to the universe and we're just gonna you know fix the world with science like that that kind of dorky like hope like mm -hmm. naive hope that uh you know the modernist mindset or whatever um and i like how uh, metamodernism kind of speaks to this like doing that again but a little bit more depressed this time you know like <laughs> <laughs> Which, like, as someone who's, like, basically spent, like, most of their life depressed, like, to me, that's exciting. Because it's like, yay, now we can <laughs> all be depressed together. Yeah. Now I can be part of the party. <laughs> um, but with the enlivenment, it's basically, like, going back to that, like, naive, hopeful energy. But you're doing it with more humility this time. You're like, okay. Like we made it through the postmodern void of like, oh God, nothing means anything anymore. And we realized that like, if we believe that nothing means anything, we can't, we're, we're powerless. Um, so we have to try to create meaning despite knowing that the meaning might not be inherent. And then the freedom that comes with that is a uh, really powerful and terrifying mm. Mm. Uh, freedom. And the whole enlivenment thing is basically saying like, yeah, rationality, um, is not just like uh, logic for the sake of logic. It's not logic for the sake of following the process. Like fo we're following the process insofar as it's applicable to our lives, making our lives better, making the world better, mm. solving the right problems, right? And not focusing on problems just because it's fun to solve problems and we, we feel good and smart about it. Mm. Um, yeah, that's kind of the, 
we ended up talking about enlivenment anyway, but yeah, that's, <laughs> so that's, you are, what you're speaking to is exactly, uh, exactly that. It's like this waking up to, uh, mythos mm-hmm. again. Mm-hmm. Um, but with the, with the knowing that, uh, mythos can mislead. And so how do mm-hmm. we use those to, uh, in like the way that Aesop did, where you're trying to help people, uh, be more ethical, more just, more virtuous, mm-hmm. or what I have more wise, all those things. Yeah. Then it, I mean, for me, this all then gets into the really fascinating, exciting territory of like the actual creation of new rituals and new mythos, right? And yeah. and the the ritual component to me is is so beautiful and um and gosh, I just I feel like so needed. Um, and it all does it hinges on having that oh, prop. You are, you <laughs> are. I absolutely love your. Um... I cannot re- wait to read that book. I'm so excited. I want to turn it into a performance art piece and I'm going to send it to you. Which one? The, the God Emerging? The God Emerging, yeah. Oh, I would love that. That'd be awesome. <laughs> yeah, the, the praxis element of this because like ritual construction is a, is a beautiful thing um, where you can really have a deep, I mean, you were talking about personal mythology earlier, but like when you can really have a deep individually kind of tailored, for lack of a better word, um, relationship with with something so that it's not like okay let's all come into a room together and I'll do the same thing and now we've done the magic thing that causes us to be okay in the world or something it's more like what do I need to do to be right with the world and how do I what do I what can I do that would facilitate making me feel that way um and and sort of em- embracing that project with kind of open eyes so that you don't get kind of hoodwinked by your own creations and yet still get sort of the, the the positive element that comes from liturgy and ritual and art and things like that. I love the phrase uh, uh, ritual art because for me, like what art does, you know, when you go to a play, you don't point your finger at the stage and be like, everyone up there is lying. Those aren't real. That's not really Jocasta or whatever. You know what I mean? It's like, everyone's in on it. They're like, okay, I understand. But it's like, but we're all here. Why are we here? Because, because this moves us because it changes us and it makes us different, you know, um, and, and we're aware of it. And so I think that that's what the art piece really brings to a lot of this. Um, it's not something that we kind of take from on high and need to continually transmit for all time through future generations. It's like yeah. participatory and new. And um, I don't know. So that uh, this is what gets me excited about all, about all this stuff. Do you do you see, um, you know, like practices that people could engage in or, or certain things that people could could just like directly implement around some of these ideas? Like, is there a kind of, you know, starting place for some of this uh, in your mind of like, yeah. Yeah, so the two main things that, and I'm speaking from like a personal, okay, so I can speak from my experience and then I can speak from what other people that I would consider ritual artists uh, are also doing. So one of the key components, of it are just repetition and trance, right? Those are like two really important parts. Um, Being able to take uh, a creative uh, methodology that you already feel drawn to, right? Um, And just seeing it as a sacred practice. So it starts with just really changing the way that you perceive of what it is you already do. Um, do you make coffee every morning, get some really nice coffee, um, and a really nice mug and, uh, make coffee like it's art, make coffee like you give a fuck, like, and do it slowly and do it sensually and see, see how that changes your experience of coffee. Maybe like make a coffee altar, right? Like, like just find a table, put a tarot card on it and put a coffee bean on it and just see what that does, how that transforms your experience of your space. It's deceptively simple. Like how easy, it's just, it's already alive inside of our mm-hmm. minds. Um, oh, and waking up that part of us is like as simple as just deciding that something is sacred. Cause that's what we've always done. Like the sun is not inherently sacred. It's a giant like ball of gas in the sky Mm -hmm. we look at that thing and we go wow that's god (laughs) Mm. 
you just do that next time you pick up a coffee bean and see what that does, you know? So that's, you know, the simple way of doing it. Um, some other ways of doing it are just looking at the characteristics of ritual uh, from a historical perspective. So um, there's typically some degree of like formalism, you know, get, getting dressed up or whatever. Like if you're going on a date, and you decide that you want to wear like, so I, I don't like wear makeup that much. Um, but on days when I wear makeup, there are days where I feel like that day is a very special and important day. And I want to like commemorate that day by, um, by decorating my body. Right. Um, you can apply this to like, do you paint? Like, okay. So when you, do you want to paint something that, um, represents something very, very special to you? And when you paint that thing, um, go into it with, a uh, just pour your entire soul into it. Right. Mm. Um, think about it from the perspective of like psychological integration. That's a thing too. So if you're trying to like make peace with something inside of you, uh, I know a person who was a part of my workshop who, um, they had this very amazing thing that they do where they, so they do like parts work through and they integrate that into their tattooing practice. And every time they meet a new part of themselves, they give themselves a tattoo to, um, to sort of symbolize welcoming that part and loving that part and, and allowing themselves to embody that part. Um, in if the, in the context of community, I have been a part of a, a community for three years now, uh, run by my friend, Brendan Ward, who, uh, he calls it the Bob Pop Challenge. And the joke of the Bob Pop Challenge, it's like a trickstery kind of container where the joke is that uh, if we make, uh, if we all just make enough songs uh, because of the law of large numbers, one of them will eventually become a top 40 hit one day. <laughs> uh, so we're going to three years. Um, we do it every week. And every week we meet and we discuss and we play the songs and we talk about people's evolution and we talk about uh we give feedback and all of that so in the context of community it's deeply vulnerable to um first of all to make yourself create something like a song every week uh forces you to look at your uh your linear growth um and then doing that and being witnessed by the same people that's like um <sighs> It's like combative intimacy or something. It's like very <laughs> <intense>. so <laughs> connecting with other people, allowing yourself to be seen in that way is highly transformative. Um, and that's a type of ritual that goes beyond the, uh, just like the, the subjective, it kind of almost brings you more into the objective because you have to like look at yourself uh, from multiple perspectives, including the perspective of your current self looking at your past self or the perspective of a past friend looking at uh, your past self or your future, your current friends looking at your past self or your current self and to tie all those things together uh, to get a perspective on you uh, and your creative essence. Um, so there's there's a lot of different ways to go about it. It's, it's so um, complex and uniquely tailored to each person. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, I'm available for like questions if people are confused, if people see this and they're like, what is she talking about? I'm, I'm, I'm here to talk about it more. Um, cool. Obviously. So, well, I know. Yeah. I mean, I think you're right too, though, that it is, I, I, I think people will hear this and be like, yes, yes, yes. I think it kind of just lands and makes sense. Um, a couple, a couple of things that you were saying, you know, we, there's so much talk or there has been about mindfulness these days in our culture. It's like, how do we get more mindful? Right. But like, but what you were just saying about coffee is like a perfect example of it. And it's not right. It's sort of something that people think that they have to kind of force themselves to do. But if you make making coffee beautiful, then it, you're not like forcing yourself to be mindful. You're, it's a ritualistic engagement that it just draws out mindfulness as sort of a natural byproduct. It's like ritual brings about mindfulness when properly done, um, was sort of a really interesting connection when you, when you were saying, um, and then, uh, and then when you were talking about doing ritual in the context of community and with other people around, that's a really interesting thing for me too, because I feel like in some ways we're so, 
we're, we're, it's like having not done this collectively for so long in some ways, it, it seems like we're all trying to figure this out again in some ways. We're trying to bring this new way, this new sensibility to it. And, yeah. and we're kind of, it's a little bit hard. And so one of the things that came up for me when you were talking was like, I totally, I love the idea of like a little coffee, coffee altar, but then it's sort of like, then you invite your friend over, right? And then you've got this altar there with a coffee bean and a tarot card, right? And it's sort of like, I feel like, I guess what I'm getting at is like, I think that some people will feel embarrassed or self-conscious about, about engaging the world this way. And like, I wonder what you would say to that. And, and if you have any thoughts on, on what that, what that entails to kind of, is there something you have to kind of get over, or get over your self-consciousness or just kind of do it, see what it's like. And, and I don't know. Well, this is the sincere, I feel like uh, sincere irony is the almost like the tonic for this is um, we're, we're kind of coming out of a cultural obsession with, uh, with nihil nihilism and, and critique and, and, um, and uh, almost reveling in meaninglessness. And uh, I, I have this with my friends a lot where like, I, I feel fear of being uh, like, there's this natural self-consciousness that comes with being like, yeah, I grew up with an altar. Um, my parents always had an altar. Their altar was not to coffee beans. It was to ancestors. Um, so there's part of me that has like that, I guess I'll just, I'll playfully refer to it as privilege uh, of being exposed to uh, mildly animistic uh, view of the world. My parents are deeply spiritual people. I have a little bit more of the rationalist in me than they do. So there's always been that tug of war of like, I can't fully take this seriously, um, but I need it and I crave it and it enriches my life and it enhances my experience so much that I can't throw it out with the bathwater. Um, and uh, I think you need to be willing to make, be made fun of. You need to be willing to make fun of yourself. Mm. Um, that's actually kind of inspiring to people. That's <laughs> so the only reason that like I have internet friends is because I spent almost an entire year making fun of myself. And that was like my, my integration practice was just getting on the internet and being like, here's the thing that I think sucks about me, isn't this? But it's hilarious that, that I do this, like what? <laughs> And then other people get in on that and they're like, yeah, wow, being human is just the dumbest thing ever. Like, it's mm. great. Like, let's just, you know, not we not take ourselves that seriously. So you want to have reverence for your coffee bean. First, the first thing I would do would be like, be like, I'm literally about to worship a coffee bean right now. <laughs> like, <laughs> that's ridiculous. Yeah, your friend's going to make fun of you. Like, why wouldn't they? <laughs> You know, it's like, so one, one um, thing I like to reference that I should probably do more research on because I reference it all the time. And yet I just can't remember the name of the specific culture that does it, which is, <laughs> which is bad. Um, but there's a specific culture that I can't remember the name of that has like a ceremony and uh, the ceremony is very sacred, right? As the ceremonies normally are but there's a specific role that certain community members play where they actively make fun of uh, and like disrespect the, um, the ceremony. Mm. And the purpose, they've, they've said the purpose of this uh, is to ensure that the, uh, the sacred does not become dogmatic. And that's, there's something to be said about that, about mm -hmm. there being like a, a role specifically for that trickster archetype. And the trickster is given a job and the trickster's job is to make sure that the sacred doesn't become, uh, that the king doesn't become a tyrant, right? Um, or, or something. And yeah. um, that almost enhances and maintains the sacredness in a deeper way. Like you think about uh, <laughs> the freaking Romans again, right? And, and Saturnalia where like everything's tops, it's basically their topsy turvy day um, where everybody's cross dressing and getting high and uh, masters become slaves and slaves become masters for a day and like turning everything on its head. Uh, that's, that's perspectivism right there. That's giving you a different way of looking at things. 
um, just to ensure that you don't become married to your own worldview. And that's another reason why rituals are so powerful, I think, is, is uh, not just the individual way of, um, uh, on like a cog, in, in a cognitive way, they kind of like shift our way of, of uh, recognizing patterns, but in a collective way, they kind of shift our way of recognizing patterns um, in our relationships and whatnot. Yeah, that's interesting because like it's, it's like rituals disrupt our lives. Mm-hmm. And yet at the same time, rituals need to be disrupted. It's kind of an interesting, yeah. you know, yeah. back and it's forth. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, because there's, there's like, um, you know, I feel like so much of that nihilism and the, and ennui, you know, and that kind of modern malaise is based in the sense that like, it's all the same. It just keeps going, you know, like there's, you know, when you compare like the modern way of being in the world, say to a traditional calendar where like you have high holy days that, you know, and the, that, that, that things are like time is different or even cyclical. And like, you know, it totally shifts your sense of being in the world. But then when you just get into the sort of, yep, another day, another day, another day, I'll do the other thing, blah, blah, blah. And so one of the things that ritual and, and, and really all sacred art seem to do is like, do this weird thing that kind of shakes you out of that enough that you're, it's sort of like, no, it's, it's something different right now. And it forces you again, to be mindful of it, but also just to, to like, yeah, be alive, to be aware and awake. And like, I'm doing this intentionally. I'm not, I'm not just on autopilot. Um, And yet too, you know, it's like, yeah, then, then the, the, those things themselves need to be appropriately uh, subverted, you know, um, so anyway, all that stuff is so interesting. Um, yeah. yeah. Well, in our final couple of minutes, is there anything that we haven't oh, talked about that, that you, that you want to bring into any of the, any of the mix here? I didn't mean to cut you off if you were. No, it's okay. I was just going to say, God, we could probably talk about this. Really <laughs> Indeed. Uh, just as you were saying, Oh, we should probably wrap up soon. I was well, feeling the same way. Well, Hey, thank you. This has been so awesome. It's been great to finally connect with you. Yeah. And I just want to thank you for all the, the work that you're doing, which is exciting and awesome. And, um, I know that, you know, well, one, I'm sure we'll be talking again before too long, but two, I know I'll be seeing, everyone will be seeing so much more of the stuff that you're doing and, uh, just, you know, yeah, really appreciate the role that you play in this community and the, the insights and the perspective that you have is, is deeply appreciated. So thank you so much. Thank you. And same to you.